great honor of uh, introducing Dr. Cynthia Pilstone, Cindy to most of us. And uh, Cindy has done um, a lot of work on particles and developed techniques to measure particles and uh, in the water column and also some work in sediments. She did her undergraduate degree at the University of Vermont and all of her graduate work at Harvard, although much of that was done with Susan Jo in, in Woods Hole. Uh, and so we'd like to welcome her today to talk about down, up, and out dynamics. Welcome Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is great to be here. Really, really lovely. Are you wearing your microphone? I, oh, I am. Sorry. Okay, turn on. I am, but I didn't turn it on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Oh, my voice sounds like a little bit. Uh, it's nice to be here. I've been here quite a while since Jenny's proposal defense. Yeah, I forgot to welcome yeah. our, our most senior student. Our senior <laughs> summer student is just arrived <laughs> So it's always good to come back with a lot of colleagues here. Okay, so we get going. Um, the, the down and out and up, down and out is obviously a reference to where carbon is moving with particular reference to this uh, shell sea system. So I'll get right into it. Um, and you can obviously guess that we're going to be talking a lot about sediment trap work. All right. Okay. What what have I studied? Uh, my my focus over the last <laughs> 25 years or so has been to examine processes of particle flux and particle formation. So in particular, uh, I'm I'm interested in that which sinks through the water column as carbon, particulate carbon, nitrogen, silica, relative to the processes of production, biological production in the upper water column, which might change on a seasonal to interannual to longer term basis. And this connects us to climate variability. I'm also very interested in the lower carbon and silica and nitrogen rain relative to what we see in underlying sediments. Because the underlying sediments provide us with a long history of carbon of what we would call carbon paleoflux or paleoflux events. So I like going through the whole system. I sort of started on the bottom, asked questions about the sediments, realized I had to go up into the water column to answer those. Then when I went up into the water column, I went back to the sediments. So I go back and forth quite a bit. But um, I primarily put mooring systems, which I'll show you in this region below the euphotic zone, to collect the products of production and, and sinking from the overlying water column. So this is, this is a pump schematic, which I'm sure many of you have seen before, explaining the transfer of carbon through the ocean as per biological productivity, sinking, degradation, and eventually uh, sedimentation. And uh, the processes that, that obviously modulate that would be remineralization, degradation as material, as labile material sinks through the ocean, and ultimately uh, a small percentage is preserved in the sediments, which were left to uh, sample with cores. Okay, so a little review here because I know a lot of students and from diverse backgrounds. Uh, who's responsible for carbon sinking in the ocean? What are the particle producers? These are the primary producers. We're talking about the silica producing diatoms, the calcium carbonate producing coccolis, uh, shown here in a number of these uh, photomicrographs. And also we have macro and micro, macro and micro plankton, zooplankton, that consume. Uh, phytoplankton produce detritus through uh, defecation, uh, death and dying, and all that all that good activity that happens in the in the upper water column and in the midwater, and all all of this the the feeding and 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 growing and dying produces this large mass of uh, detritus sinking through the ocean of high in carbon inorganic, organic, and biogenic silica. And you just see a number of the players here. In particular, this is a planktonic foram and uh, radiolarian, these are protozoans which actually consume smaller particles and produce very nice uh, tests or skeletons that are preserved in the sediments. And so we, we use these, uh, these skeletons in the sediments to look at, to project what productivity uh, was, was doing in the past, really. So quick review of that. Um, so what do, what do particles look like? What do sinking particles look like in the ocean? Well, they're not, you have a lot of fine suspended material, but the material that really translates the mass through the ocean are these detrital aggregates or fecal pellets. We also refer to uh, marine snow. So you're thinking of material that are products 
of all this biological activity. And what we see when we collect uh, sinking particulates is we see these shells, remains of uh, zooplankton, such as uh, foraminifera or microzooplankton and radiolarians and um, pteropods, all of that producing minerals that sink, biogenic minerals. But we also see lots of zooplankton fecal pellets because all those copepods and all those euphausias that are so abundant in the ocean produce a lot of organic detritus through feeding. And these are uh, scanning electron micrographs. Um, these are from my thesis, which are ancient, absolutely ancient. And uh, this is a zooplankton fecal pellet with containing lots of diatoms. You can see the diatom remains. I mean, they're munching on those diatoms. This is actually a, a, a radiolarian, which is uh, rare to find in a zooplankton fecal pellet. These are a couple hundred microns in length, approximately, sinking through the ocean at up to 100 or so meter or more meters per day. We also see flocculent material that, that is very mucus rich that collects other sinking particles. So you can imagine um, organisms that feed with certain types of mucus feeding nets, such as larvations, you may have heard of, they're a type of tunica. They produce a feeding net, and then when they collect enough material that that feeding net becomes, is clogged, they jettison it and produce another one. Well, that jettison material sinks through the ocean, and as it does, it, it passively scavenges other sinking materials. So you can imagine this is sort of like that. Mary Silver was famous for comparing this to the dust bunnies. Under, under your bed, some of you may have those, <laughs> that picks up lots of little things as time goes on and you know moves around and the vacuum cleaner doesn't get there. So think, think of that, that, these are sort of the dust bunnies in the ocean, great snow. So how do we collect sinking particles in the ocean? Well, this has been a, 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 a big uh, question that, we, that we've been uh, approaching for a number of years using what we call, uh, which many of you are familiar with, we have quite a number of sediment trap aficionados here, uh, but I'll review quickly. We use instruments called uh, sediment traps. Now, sediment traps is kind of a misnomer. I always <laughs> was not happy with that because that which sinks in the ocean and is collected in a sediment trap that is deployed in the water column is not necessarily that which gets to the sediment because there's a lot of, as I've been talking, a lot of processes that happen between the production of sinking particles and their movement through the ocean. Obviously, this is not a completely vertical system. We have lateral components, we have degradation, we have dissolution. So that which gets into the sediments is a small fraction, and yes, it is related to what we see sinking in the upper water column, but certainly what you collect in the sediment trap is not what you're going to see uh, hundreds of meters or thousands of meters below, exactly. And because of these processes of degradation, dissolution, if you plot what we call the mass particle flux, it's what we measure with these uh, deployable systems in the water column, we're measuring an amount of material mass per area per time. We usually uh, measure that as milligrams or grams per meter squared per day. And we know that this, if you plotted this mass per meter squared per day, uh, you, it would increase uh, with depth, and we, we know that to be, to be a fact from all measuring with various systems, um, it, sediment trap systems, but then it, then it decreases because we, we see a degradation, a remineralization, we see organic matter disappearing, uh, certainly as a function of biological activity in the water column. But sometimes, many times on the margin and at the base of the deep slope in the ocean, we find that this curve, I've added to it, doesn't, doesn't decrease the bottom, it actually increases near the bottom. And that's as a result of bottom resuspension. And I'll be talking quite a bit about that later on. Uh, so this is a bar bottom particle resuspension zone. <clears throat> Particles are sourced from the bottom and from the overlying water column, but something physical has to keep them in suspension for a very long, for a, an, on a permanent or semi-permanent permanent basis. <clears throat> so when we measure uh, sinking fluxes, you see the, all these different gizmos here. We, we choose our system based on the time and scale that we want to measure sinking particle flux. So for example, if you wanted to go out and look at the material, the zooplankton fecal pellets produced at a couple hundred meters over the course of uh, the week of a spring, a spring bloom, for example. You might put in one of these drifting sediment trap arrays. They would be out for only a matter of a few days. You collect a very discrete sample from that, from that activity. But if you want to look more at what might make it to the bottom of the ocean, to the sediment water interface, and over long periods of time in one place, 
we've, as opposed to, to these drifting traps or surface tether traps, we put in what we call bottom board sediment traps. So we're looking in there, there at one place, uh, one time, one depth over a long period of time. Now we, we put these on, on, on a mooring that goes up in the wire column. We'll have several different uh, of these traps. And uh, this is what I use in, in particular because I'm interested in long-term time series of material making it to the deep ocean, uh, either on the margin or, or in the deep sea. And then there are these new types of traps um, oh, sorry, I didn't have the IRS in here. Uh, older older figure. It's... You know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There are a variety of other traps that are designed. One is this free drifting, neutrally buoyant trap that will f follow a water mass or a density surface. So you will, you're interested in just looking at the particulates that are sinking through that area. And then there are other types of traps that we more that want to, that uh, the objective is to. Um, exclude uh, swimmers that make that come into the trap, and also to look at inside you settling rates, which are the, the traps that, that David and, and, and Cindy certainly are, uh, are deploying. Okay, so the, the, this whole idea of increasing with depth, I just want you to remember that. And if you were, if you if you went down through the water column and you measured this milligrams per meter square per day, and you all of a sudden saw a jump near the bottom even tens of meters off the bottom, you know you have resuspension input of, of particulate material. So this is something that we've learned after doing this over many, many, many years. Okay, so again, for the high temporal uh, resolution, deep water or um, sub, subsurface, sub euphotic zone uh, fluxes, we use these time series sediment traps. This is just a schematic so you can get a feel for how big they are, they stand. Um, about a meter and a half high, they're about a meter in diameter. They have a uh, what we call a honeycomb baffle surface that is a couple centimeters thick. But um, the bottom line is we put, we put several of these sediment traps on to subsurface moorings. Now this um, here is not the surface of the ocean because they're, all, they're, they're below the surface. You don't have any surface expression. And so we can collect sinking material on a time series basis with these cups that we pre-program to rotate under the cone at certain times, whenever you want, depending on what your what your 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 seasonality might be in the region that you're you're working. So you can see that you can collect over time. For example, each one of these cups represents two weeks at a certain location, and so you can see the change in the amount of material that gets collected in the cups at a certain depth is a function of the productivity and production of sinking detritus in the overlying water column that made it to that, to that depth. So you might be at 100 meters, 200 meters, 1,000 meters, 3,000 meters. <clears throat> we pre-poison uh, all our sediment trap cups that go into, um, in the water with uh, usually a formalin solution to uh, stop the, most of the microbial activity because we're interested in looking at organic carbon and other labile components that uh, would otherwise be, uh, be lost to uh, bacterial degradation. We can leave these in the water for six, month, six months, 12 months, depending on how far you have to go. You know, you stick them in the Antarctic, don't usually go back for a year. Stick them in you know, the North Atlantic, they'll go back in six months. Okay, so I, I have been a very fortunate girl. <laughs> I've been able to work in some really great places. So this is just a, a, a general list. If you're interested in you know, working around the world, sediment trap work is kind of it, <laughs> and as well as coring work. It, studying these processes, you can have the opportunity certainly to go everywhere. So these are some of the regions that, I want to, that I've worked in using not just time series sediment traps, but coupled with core, coring work, uh, box coring, multi-coring, and uh, more recently, long coring. Uh, additionally, I've done, <clears throat> we've done um, in my lab and uh, in conjunction with, with colleagues, developed a number of in situ camera systems that go on to vehicles, um, ROVs or uh, submersibles, as well as on their, their own uh, towed system. They tow through the water and image particles in situ that are then analyzed uh, with uh, computer software to look at what's there, there's fragile aggregates, how many are there, how fast are they moving through the water column. So ideally, we couple these types of studies with the time series sediment traps so we can get short and long time scale uh, understanding of how much um, organic matter is moving through, through the ocean. So I'm going to talk to you about this high productivity coastal non-upwelling region called the Gulf of Maine. 
today. So for those of you who um, are not familiar with the Gulf of Maine, it's just up the coast, <laughs> north a bit, uh, it's uh, what we call a, a, a shelf sea, an inland sea, and this is um, a general uh, schematic of the circulation, the major circulation um, uh, flows in, in the Gulf of Maine. Um, so it's bounded by, of course, Nova Scotia in the, nor in the, in the, the down east portion, and, uh, and the, the Cape Cod and, and the islands, certainly in the, in the southwest. And the, and, the, and the offshore boundary is really Georges Bank, which I'm sure you've heard of because of its very high fisheries production. Uh, this, this is a very interesting region because of its location, which is here, relative to the larger scale circulation dynamics in the North Atlantic. Uh, the, the Gulf of Maine receives waters from, um, from essentially the, the Labrador Current and across uh, the Scotian Shelf, which change in composition, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, relative to climate uh, and seasonality as well. And, and large uh, atmospheric pressure systems. So what, what gets into the Gulf of Maine very much in terms of this flow that goes through this channel here has a lot to do with what's going on um, up in the, in the, in the higher, uh, higher latitudes. It's about a one year renewal time for the, the Gulf water volume. And um, we, this is a region of very, very strong tides. And so we have um, a, a tidal mixing, diurnal um, tidal mixing component um, that is um, essentially the, the rule here. We have a coastal current that is generated by the inflow of offshore waters, comes up into the Bay of Fundy, then wraps around. This is a, on an on a annual basis. Seasonally, it, it does uh, obviously change. We have some uh, smaller gyres that develop over these basins, Jordan Basin, Wilkinson, and uh, George's Basin, and then a small outflow um, called Great South Channel. Um, in, to, in, the, in the southwest. So essentially the most important components for the, the carbon and the production and the, and the ecosystem dynamics in the Gulf of Maine is this water that comes in through this deep north, uh, northeast channel and the amount of time that that water resides in, in the Gulf of Maine and what impacts tidal, tidal fluctuations and tidal mixing have in the, in the deeper waters and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Very high productivity season, or season, very high productivity system. Oops, sorry. I'm going to go back. <laughs> yeah, right. Back here. No, you're like, oh, the left one. Yeah, there we go. Did I get it? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. This is the problem with glasses. You can't go away. What I'm showing you here, just to give you a feel for seasonal productivity um, in the Gulf of Maine, um, is uh, the Gulf of Maine sea whiffs. These are sea whiffs uh, uh, carbon, uh, sorry, chlorophyll images, uh, ocean color imagery, which is an indicator of the amount of chlorophyll in the surface waters. And so what you're looking at here, these are taken from Thomas et al. 2003, are several months that show you the difference over the course of the year in the surface chlor phytoplankton chlorophyll, which is an indicator of when we have um, high primary production in the surface water. So December blue is just essentially think of blue being very, very low chlorophyll, red being, being the higher end of the spectrum, in fact, quite high in terms of milligrams per, per cubic meter. So December, of course, winter very low. Then we move into, of course, the spring bloom period, very high. August is kind of moderate. And then it drops again, and then we have a, another period in November where, where the chlorophyll is higher. And this is reflected, what you're looking at here is the chlorophyll um, over time, the chlorophyll concentration in the surface waters at certain locations in the offshore Gulf of Maine region. So we're looking at stations uh, right around in here and then uh, right off, off of, of George's Bank. And so you, you see these seasonal peaks. This, this, Solid one is Wilkinson Basin, which is located in the west. You see a very strong spring uh, bloom peak represented by this high chlorophyll, or the high chlorophyll is suggestive of the spring bloom, and certainly uh, in, in the fall as well. And you see that at the other locations. So we have these annual spring-fall, typical temperate ocean um, productivity, high productivity seasons. Overall, the productivity in the, in the Gulf of Maine is fairly high, 300 to 400 
<coughs> excuse me, 450 grams carbon per meter square per year. That's from multiple sources over many, many people's work. Um, and, and from a number of studies that have been done by colleagues up at UNH, looking at um, the upper 50 meters of oxygen and CO2 uh, levels. We know that uh, the Gulf is sort of a, is a mean CO2 sink or removal from the atmosphere uh, during the spring and the summer primarily, but in the late fall and winter it becomes a CO2 efflux, a source to the atmosphere. So this is all a function, of course, of the amount of CO2 being drawn down by uh, phytoplankton product, primary productivity. And if you uh, look at this, integrate this over the year, which I won't show you all of it, but it's in, in Vandermark at all, 2010, the net community production, so that the production minus respiration, uh, gives us a, essentially the, the result that the Gulf of Maine is a, is a small net source uh, region of CO2 to the atmosphere. So we put, uh, in, in order to look at, we know what's happening in the surface ocean or surface waters, we have an idea of the seasonality, we want to look at what, hap what translates through the water column in this very shallow water column. We're talking about bottom depths are only up to 300 meters. So those basins I pointed out, um, uh, Jordan Basin, Wilkinson Basin, and George's Basin, greatest depths are 300. So we're, we're, it's a fairly shallow, and, and most, of, most of this area is all about 100 meters. And then we drop right off, uh, off, to the, off into the, uh, the slope waters off of um, George's Bay. So we put a number of, system, of mooring systems out over the years all of which have two sediment traps, these time series um, rotating cup uh, sediment traps. Um, in, in these locations um, noted by the stars, we've added a uh, number of instruments to them. Um, because these sediment traps have a lot of space in the frame, we can put um, optical instruments such as transmissometers that measure light transmission, beam attenuation, for those who are familiar with it, as a function of how much suspended material is in the water that that impacts how much light is transmitted through the water. So we can measure that, CTD, so we can get a, uh, get a time series hydrography, uh, uh, backscattering sensors, things like that you can add to the system. We also put um, on these moorings, on the traps, um, many um, acoustic Dopplers, because it's very important in this, especially in this um, fairly shallow system to understand what the lateral flow is and how that might impact the amount of material, organic material that's moving through the water column. So we need to have it on, on the same um, basis as, as we're collecting our, our seven trap data. Okay, this is really old data, but it's good data, so I guess I'll show it. Uh, this is what you're looking at here, not to you know, blow away by all these funny little plots, is we're looking at um, time series exports, so we're trap fluxes in milligrams and grams per meter squared per day at two locations. One in the western Gulf of Maine, Wilkinson Basin, one in the eastern, so that's why I have west and east. The depths are shown here, 150, 150, 250, 250. And what you're looking at is the total flux of material through the water column at these two sites uh, over, of course, uh, between 1995 and 1997. Where there are breaks is where uh, fishing trawlers, unfortunately, fishing trawling was fairly common in this, in this region back then, uh, hit the mooring, so we had to, you know, Go rescue it, get back, pay bondage fees, and all kinds of things, give out TV sets. And, uh, and I'm not kidding about that. But um, So uh, actually, the east, though, Jordan Basin, was relatively unscathed, never, never hit by fishing trawling. There's very little trawling back then, and now none at all, because this is right near the Hague Line, the Hague Line being the boundary between Canadian waters and US waters. So you don't want to be straying over into the Canadian waters. Uh, and so there, there's very, there was very little fishing there. And so, and so I put the mooring as close as I possibly could because I figured, well, no one's going to mess with it out there. So we, that's why we have a longer time series. But what I want you to notice is several things. One are the spring and fall peaks and the total amount of material, just look at the 150, that are coming, moving through the water column, both in the west and in the east. The other thing I want you to notice, so that's a reflection of the spring-fall blooms and the mass of material that's sinking through the water that the scale changes. Now we're at 250 meters, and you notice we're at gram scale here. These deep water gram scale fluxes that also show a reflection of a seasonal periodicity in addition to a number of other peaks not reflected in the, in the upper water column, 
are evidence of particle resuspension, of a very strong particle resuspension zone. And when I say resuspension, I don't mean it's just from the underlying sediments per se, which I'll show you um, why that is. But what you need to think of is that this is a region where you go from fairly particle-free water um, above into a zone where it's very turbid. Is that 18 on the right and 1.8 on the left? Yeah, this is the so 0 to 18. So it's a, it's a scale change both it, ways. Exactly. And so, and what, what, and then the other, other, whoops, whatever it is, substantially larger. So the resuspension, the, this nephloid layer, I'm going to explain what a nephloid but this particle resuspension zone, which is called a bottom nephloid layer, <coughs> is much stronger in this basin region, in the eastern Gulf of Maine, than in the western Gulf of Maine. And that's reflected by the difference in the, in the grams of, of material collected in the sediment trap over time. Now, if you, just, you, you take these same samples and you analyze them for organic carbon, what we see are several things. One is that, of course, we get, uh, well, not of course, it's nice if we do, we get peaks of organic carbon delivery during the spring and the fall, following uh, at the end of those um, seasonal bloom periods in the surface waters. But we'll, and we also see that translated, the big peaks translated into this, these, the, deeper, the deeper waters in this particle resuspension zone. But we also see quite a difference between the eastern and the, or the western and the eastern Gulf of Maine, in that the uh, the western Gulf of Maine, in terms of the amount of organic carbon that is being delivered through the water column, is is higher, uh, not just in in uh, in the in the total amount, but in the concentration of organic carbon. So the 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 eastern Gulf of Maine has a, has a basically a lower carbon transport. And that will become uh, key when we start looking at what's transporting the carbon. So high seasonality reflected in deep and shallow, very high particle resuspension evidenced by these grand scale fluxes, um, particle fluxes in the, in the deeper waters, and, um, and a difference between east and west um, Gulf of Maine. So if we look at um, opal and silica, you see that green line? I'm going to draw it. Um, if, if you look at how much now, we're, we're talking about carbon, now let's talk about silica. This is diatom silica. This is a, um, opal and silica material produced by diatoms that sinks through the water column. Again, just in summary, we, we get peaks certainly in the upper water column during the fall and during the spring periods of, of maximum export. But we see that the higher, there are higher export of, or, of biogenic silica in the east versus versus, uh, I'm sorry, in the west versus the east. So the region that had the higher carbon, organic carbon, has the higher silica. I'm not going to like this. <laughs> and uh, we'll get to that in a moment when I show the carbonate. And the, 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 or the, um, the material responsible, of course, are the, the remains of, of these very large diatoms, um, rise of selenia, and uh, is, is very abundant in the Gulf of Maine, if any of you know of those, and some large centric diatoms. This you can't see it, but these are centric diatoms all within a, in a fecal pellet. Now we see that, that opal peak translated through, the, through into this bottom resuspension zone, certainly on a seasonal basis, but at the same time, if you look over here, okay, so that peak's there, you know, and that's translated and all, but, but there are other multiple peaks. The resuspension is, is, is being fed not just from above, but by uh, processes um, up near the bottom. Now we look at carbonate. Now this is our other major component that we look at in the sediment traps. And the calcium carbonate that is translated, is fluxing through the water column in this shelf sea, is largely made up of pteropod or agonite. There's lots and lots of pteropods that live in, in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and they are providing a number of these, these seasonal peaks. Again, that we see a, a spring, a fall, and all, actually a winter peak. The winter peak are the, are the pteropods. They're very, very abundant in the winter. Um, but what's interesting is that the eastern Gulf of Maine now emerges as a carbonate export system in terms of quantity of calcium carbonate. We see four amps being delivered to the sediments in the eastern Gulf of Maine versus the western. We see these winter peaks in pteropod aragonite that, is not that are not preserved in the sediments. The pteropod aragonite is never preserved. And if you know anything about carbonate chemistry, you know that um, pteropod aragonite, aragonite is a lot less stable um, calcium carbonate than, uh, than calcite. 
And so the calcite of the forams makes it into the sediments. We collect them, but the pteropods, pteropods do not. These are uh, some of the coiled pteropods. They're called limacina. And then another carbonate producer in the Gulf of Maine, these are primary producers, um, the pteropods and the forams uh, being consumers, not producers um, of primary production, but um, coccoliths being the product from coccolithophores or the list. They, we don't see them in the sediments at all. They dissolve certainly well before. Uh, maybe in the nephloid layer, we don't see them in the sediments at all. So we see minimal preserved carbonate. And what, what, what we see here, as opposed to what we've seen in other places in the world, is that high, the higher carbonate export is not associated with the high organic carbon, so the whole ballast thing. But that probably has a lot to do with the fact that we have four amps transporting most of the carbonate. And they're going to be very rapid uh, to the bottom. And, and their organic carbon is going to be quite low relative to the mass of, of diatom, uh, diatom silica associated organic carbon. So if you then you know hang around long enough, you do the track work one century to do it in another. And uh, it just depends on, on how how if you know funding goes. So what I'm showing you here again this is just at 150 meters. So this is the, the export measured below the euphotic zone. We're not talking about resuspension now. Uh, in that eastern region of the Gulf of Maine, 95 through 97. This is an 18-month record. And just looking at this in terms of POC flux, particular organic carbon flux, magnitude versus 2005 to 2006. Same location, same traps, same depth, everything. Now, we have plenty of substantial interannual variability, obviously, here, because the range of organic carbon fluxes in 2005, 2006 is much more muted and much lower than we had back in the mid 90s. So just, just interannual variability or is there something else going on here in terms of uh, 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 changes in the, in, the, in the Gulf of Maine itself? So we, we noticed that, that there's a 50% lower uh, flux and that the material is, is actually um, lower in, in, in organic carbon content. So not just the, the amount of material, but the content of that material is, is lower in organic carbon. What's the difference between when you look at these samples? Uh, these samples contain large um, organic aggregates within the sediment traps, uh, a lot of that mucus material, um, very large uh, zooplankton fecal pellets, whereas these samples, nothing in the greater than one millimeter fraction. We separate out the traps and we look at, well, where's stuff you know, falling in terms of sieve fraction. Very little material that's large and, and very tiny zooplankton fecal pellets. So complete, this is where, you, you know, you can't just do the chemistry. You gotta kind of look at it under the microscope and, and because it's, the remains are gonna tell you a lot about how to explain the chemistry, really. So we do see the, these differences and we see a similar thing happening in the Western Gulf of Maine over the same time period, but I won't really show you that. Okay, so what's going on? Well, when I saw this, I started thinking, oh, maybe there's some decadal changes going on here. Because, I, of course, I heard rumor that there was. And what we might be, what we're looking at, likely, is a change in the POC export over decadal changes, which should be hardly surprising, as a fun function of changes in the planktonic ecosystem and in the, the, um, the, the nutrient levels and, um, and mixing levels in the Gulf of Maine. Okay. What you're looking at here are, are some uh, uh, National Marine Fisheries data sets that they produce. Um, and you're, you're just looking at from 1970 to um, about 2000, 2005, uh, salinity, autumn, the strength of the, auto, uh, of the autumn plankton bloom. There's uh, a the way that they look at that with these, um, it's a color index on a uh, continuous plankton recorder. But just look at the relative um, lines um, or the, where the heights of these plots are um, in terms of the 90s and then uh, after 2000. So what, what we have happening, the starting with the salinity and then moving down, is that we have a freshening, clear freshening going on in the Gulf of Maine, this is Gulf of Maine wide, um, in the surface waters, um, in, in the midnight, and particularly we had a, quite a big drop in 1995. This is believed to do, be due to increased Arctic melt and input. 
but because overall temperatures <coughs> are integrated are, are actually getting warmer. But the surface waters, we see a, quite a decrease in salinity. We see at the same time the, um, the autumn um, phytoplankton bloom was enhanced during this time of lower salinity. And we also saw, they saw, uh, that small copepod numbers were much higher. So the smaller species uh, were much higher relative to larger species, which are, are noted here if you're a copepod specialist. You know, those of you will recognize that. Um, Calanus is, is the most abundant um, copepod, but who uh, doubted it? Sorry, it'll go off. Uh, and these were de decreasing in their large stages. So if we go to, oh, sorry, we go to post 2000 though, so the, these are changing. We go to post 2000, we see that the decrease in the fall phytoplankton bloom intensity um, is, is occurring. We have a particular decrease in, in actually in large diatom abundance, which I'll show you in a moment. And we think that this, this link, this change, so we're going from essentially a, a low salinity, uh, moderately um, autumn phytoplankton bloom intensity to and, and with small copepods to a post 2000 period, which we don't have all the obviously the plots here, where we, we're seeing the opposite happen. So why is this? What, what is this related to? Okay, now we get sort of get, go outside the Gulf of Maine and think about larger scale atmospheric um, changes, fluctuations, and and, and climate variability uh, that are affecting the region. Remember I told you that what happens in the Gulf of Maine is very highly connected to what happens up uh, in the Arctic. What we need to consider is, is how that changes over time. In the mid-90s, we had uh, what we call a phase shift in uh, a system that controls a lot of the water inflow into the Gulf of Maine called the North Atlantic Oscillation. It's essentially, um, <coughs> excuse me, an atmospheric pressure gradient that determines helps determine the amount of warm, salty water that flows into the Gulf of Maine, which we call warm slope water, versus much colder Labrador Sea slope water. So in periods of time when we call the NAO is positive, you'll see here, this is the warm slope water, here's the Gulf of Maine. You have this nice, and here's the, the Gulf Stream. You have the, the slope water forming a very thick lens, and actually, can't quite see, but that's the, that's the channel that leads into the Gulf of Maine. When NAO changes, flips, there's an atmospheric change to its negative, negative uh, phase, which I won't get into what NAO is, it's all based on isolated highs and all, but trust me. Uh, the, the Labrador slope water, which is actually Labrador, coming from the Labrador current, which is um, colder and uh, lower in nutrients, um, and uh, uh, less saline, rather, less saline, uh, makes it, it sort of cuts off, effectively cuts off the warm slope water flow into the Gulf of Maine. So NEO has these fluctuations that occur, and we can look at the relative amounts of warm slope water versus colder, less saline uh, Labrador seawater flows into the Gulf of Maine and how that might affect um, productivity. So essentially, um, what, what we see is this, when this is cut off, when the warm salty, salty water is cut off, we're in a negative NAO uh, phase. Now what happened in the 90s, when I, we had those traps out in the mid 90s, we had a very rapid change to, from a positive um, to a negative situation. And in fact, we had colder, we were starting to see colder, less saline waters coming into the Gulf of Maine. What that did was it increased stratification and it led to a stronger autumn phytoplankton bloom, not, and it lowered the intensity of the spring phytoplankton bloom. So that's why it, it's almost counterintuitive in a way, um, in, 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 some, in some instances. So the, the inflow in the 90s of this fresh water, low salinity water, uh, actually drove the system so that the autumn phytoplankton bloom, a higher stratification, and the autumn phytoplankton blooms Became, became more intense than relative to the decades before for the spring. Okay, so if you, if you look at this over, over time, now we wanna know, okay, that was the 90s, what's going on now? Well, I'm 
showing you here, what you're looking at is, again, 1960 to 2010. This is this NAO index. So just look at the average over, over time. So this big drop here, even though average, it doesn't register um, in the, the that's a, a five-year average um, of, the, of the NAO oscillation plotted in the dark line. Um, that was 95. And you can see that what's happening is the NAO is, is kind of returning to a almost a, 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 substan a subnormal situation, not, not highly positive or highly negative. <clears throat> what happened is in this large negative decrease, which you see here, and especially right this one year here, but certainly this five-year trend you see with the dark line, is that we've been actually getting more positive. Um, and in theory, if it becomes more positive, we should get more of that warm slope water in. Right? Because it's not going to be coming, uh, the, the Labrador seawater should, as we've seen over all these years, uh, is going to be lessened. But actually, we have something that's overprinting that even more. We have such high rates of, in, or enhanced rates of Arctic ice melt that that is almost, that is overprinting what we might expect to see with the, the NAO fluctuations. In other words, the accelerated rate of Arctic ice melt is counteracting what a more positive NAO would tell us, which would be more warm, salty water coming in at depth into the Gulf of Maine. We're actually getting more and more fresh, low, uh, or low saline, cold waters coming in, and they're, they're low in nitrate. Their nitrate levels are very low compared to historical um, n um, data that this is the work of Dave Townsend up at the University of Maine, who's looked at level, the um, nitrate and silicate concentrations of waters coming into the Gulf of Maine from the 60s to current time. And that nitrate in <clears> the <throat> last decade is dropping tremendously in sync with our changes in temperature, drop in temperature, so this is temperature you're looking at here, and, uh, and salinity. So Arctic ice melt, it, the rate at which it's occurring is causing the temperature and salinity to continue to decrease, but what's key is the nitrate drop is due to this large volumes of water moving across the shelf from, from, the, from Newfoundland, uh, across Cape Sable, the, uh, all, all that region that, that, that has those beautiful wide shelves north or uh, northeast of the Gulf of Maine, and nitri nitrate is removed by denitrification because this water sits over these nice productive shelves. And so the water that ends up flowing into the Gulf of Maine has been denitrified. And so the nitrate levels are low. Diatoms don't like low nitrate. And that's why the productivity is decreasing. So if we go back to, that's the surface, we go back to the deep waters. This is what I was talking about previously when I said, oh, there's this particle resuspension layer. It's called the bottom nephloid layer. It's a very dynamic, permanent to semi-permanent resuspension zone, very distinctive. Uh, if you put an instrument down called the transmissometer and you look at beam attenuation, it's just a measure of light transmission or impedance through the water, essentially, as a function of particles absorbing or scattering light. So the more particles you have, the less transmission of light you have. What you see is with depth, you see attenuation, the, so the, the amount of light that you lose per light produced uh, increases near the bottom uh, because of particle resuspension. Now this up here is, of course, particle absor absorption of light due to chlorophyll. So this is the subsurface chlorophyll maximum here. You see this in the western Gulf of Maine and in the eastern Gulf of Maine. Very, very thick, uh, 30 plus meter thick zone where the transmission tells you you have lots of suspended particles. And this has been documented by, by a lot of people. Um, every time someone goes out, they always you know, dump the CTD in and produce a, 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 a plot that looks, looks like this. So it's, it's of interest to understand how these operate. Are these nephloid layers just, is this just suspended mud? Mm. Not, not with organic carbon sediments underneath in the Gulf of Maine of up to 2% organic carbon. And what, what it, what's happening in this zone? Is it a biologically active zone? Is it moving laterally? How does it impact sedimentation? It's a, it's a zone through which particles must, must sink as they move through the water column. So we went out in um, 2004 
uh, in October 2004. Some of you might remember that was a very significant event in Red Sox Nation history. Uh, and I was at sea, so it was very painful. Uh, but maybe that was my sacrifice because they won. Um, and we, we completed all the uh, 108 stations and 15 surveys in, in 10 days. It was, it was crazy. But uh, we got some beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, pro tra uh, profile transects, which I'll show you. <clears throat> and October is not so bad in the Gulf of Maine. November, no, but October is not so bad. Although it was pretty, pretty crummy a few days. So what you're looking at here is, again, this beam attenuation. Blue is very low, means clear water. This is, red is lots of particles in the water column. And this is depth, I know you can't read these, so I just put 250, surface to 250. This is in the, you don't have to know where the, these transects are, but essentially we're moving from the western part of the Gulf all the way to the east and then up into the Bay of Fundy. <clears throat> and, and depths are, are shown here, 250, 200. So what you're looking at, the red and the yellow are the nephloid layers. These are in the basins here, in this, in, in this case, in Wilkinson Basin. And then as we move farther, um, to the, so we're going from, I'm showing you essentially A, showing you this transect, this, and then we go up to E, and then to G on this panel. So you're moving progressively off uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the northeast. So you see that these layers exist. These, these are, they're, they're, they're thick, they're there. Uh, I can find these, you know, Give me any amount of money and I'll take you to one. I, I know exactly where they are now because they're, they're, they're permanent. They go out there all the time and they're there. But what's interesting is how they um, conform or appear to conform to the bathymetry. Now, if you remember, the Gulf of Maine has a, uh, a, a circulation system coming in through the Northeast Channel and then a coastal current system that circulates down from, from Maine to New Hampshire to, um, to Massachusetts Bay. And so this would be, we would be looking along the isobaths here, especially right here and here and here. And what it appears based on this and then some larger um, uh, plots that we've done, sectional plots um, of, of beam transmission, that they are um, following the contours, which would make sense if they're um, being um, controlled by some of the, the, the coastal currents. And then this is now continuing up to the Bay of Fundy. You see some very, very thick um, nephloid layers. Again, the, the, the depth now changes up in the Bay of Fundy to bottom depth of about 125. But you can see even out into the eastern Gulf of Maine, the, the, the deep basin uh, nephloid layers, certainly, and, and then evidence of, um, of a bathymetric contour control uh, of, of these resuspension zones. So we took this data and um, plotted it as a function of depth in the, in the Gulf of Maine. And what you're looking at here is the thickness of these resuspension zones, zero to 20 meters off the bottom, which is just to define a, 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 a depth at which we, and uh, over a square meter area. So you're looking at essentially 20 cubic meters. Um, and it's, we're plotting essentially the, oh, excuse me, the, we're looking at the thickness, I'm sorry, the 20 cubic meters comes next, the thickness of this layer relative to our station. So what you're seeing here is that we have a very thick nephloid layer region in, in the Bay of Fundy out into the Jordan Basin uh, in parts of the um, north, north, um, just like this, so this northwestern um, Wilkinson Basin, uh, very shallow, or, or narrower, not, not as thick nephloid layers. This is five to 15 meters in the blue, and it's up to 50 meters plus in the red, um, over this region here, which is all ledge. So there are the, the very strong, ledge, uh, sharp topographic highs separating the basins. So we have thinner nephloid layers on the ledges, thinner along the coast, thick ones in the, in the basins, and certainly up in the Bay of Fundy. And uh, when we, we put a section together, sort of, well, of stations uh, in, along this bathymetric contour and, and along here. So we're at about um, 100 meters, uh, a series of stations, and um, 75. We find that there is certainly a connection, and you can, you can, you know, just squint, you can picture it here. 
uh, a connection of, of the nephloid layers between uh, certainly the Bay of Fundy and the Deep Jordan Basin because we, we don't have so many, except for the island there, topographic highs to, to, um, to block off a, the potential lateral movement of this material um, down through into the basins. Not so obvious here, but it's clearly there's a, there is a connection. Uh, and again, if we plot these in a, in a different manner, we can see that there's movement out into, from the, the coastal current uh, depths into, into Wilkinson Basin. So there's, there's connection and there's definitely thickness and um, no lack of resuspension in the near bottom in the Gulf of Maine. I showed you briefly some of this before, but the time series sediment traps overall uh, substantiate this. Again, uh, this, is, this is more recent data. This is in the west, this is in the east. Uh, two different depths, you see this, this trap is in the nephloid layer. Uh, we know that the total mass flux is uh, substantially higher. This is uh, 200 to 1400 milligrams, <coughs> 20 to 140. So very different um, scale. Uh, again, the, the major events are, appear to be in the, in the deeper waters, but of course there are additional bumps, uh, resuspension events that increase the particle flux that the, that the sediment trap collects. So basically particles are, the trap is down there, and you can think of material coming this way and, and doing this, you know, kind of in a, in a circle motion. Same thing in the east, very strong relationship between major e export events in the spring, for example, um, into the deeper waters, uh, but the, uh, we have gram scale here, milligram scale uh, in the upper waters. So um, that's, that's clear evidence of that. And, the, and if we separate out the opal and the carbon and the calcium carbonate and um, other components, they, they show the same type of relationship. So we stuck uh, beam um, attenuation meter or a, a transmissometer, dissolved oxygen, CTD and all, down in the, in the nephloid layer in Jordan Basin in the eastern Gulf of Maine for a period of about nine months. <clears throat> and I'm just going to show you here just briefly just some little snapshots of things we've, we've the data sets we've been able to collect to tell us that something is different down there, something's going on. It's not just resuspended boring mud, but I don't find mud boring, but you know what I'm saying. It's not just, just clays. So what we see here is you look at beam, beam, this is beam attenuation over time, you know, lots and lots of flipping around. And this is oxygen over time. We're talking about October to, um, to April. And at a time period in April where the beam attenuation seems to be um, increasing, we also see a drop in oxygen. What was interesting is we had a chlorophyll fluorometer uh, on, on the CTD, and we, I hope you can see that, uh, we see a peak, the red defines it, we see a peak in chlorophyll. So we have nice, fresh chlorophyll making it down into the nephloid layer, into this resuspension zone that's supposed to be kind of unimportant and not have anything labile in it. But, well, that was based on, on very old assumptions. Clearly that's not true, we have chlorophyll. And if you do a ratio of this signal to backscatter. Backscatter tells you how much material in the water is just refracting, reflecting light, not absorbing light, whereas organic matter absorbs light. If you do do the ratio between uh, this, which is absorption and re re refraction, and then we uh, measure just refraction, you get this, or a backscatter, really is what it's called. You get a, a ratio that changes as a function of how much absorbing versus backscattering material you have in the water column. And so what this showed that at this time where chlorophyll entered uh, the nephloid layer in this region and oxygen dropped and transmission went up, we also saw a change in this ratio indicating that we had higher organic carbon content material, which wouldn't be surprising considering we had all that chlorophyll <coughs> making it down. So no one had done this, no one had looked at chlorophyll, everyone thought, well, there wasn't any chlorophyll down there, but uh, obviously on a pulsed, system it, it, it's making it. We also did a, um, a sort of a, a quick fortuitous um, single point, you just got to take these advantage of these things when you can, pump sampling of the nephloid layer. This was with um, Tim Eglinton, uh, who was at, at Hui and Shomshit Wang, looking at C14. Now 
C14 can tell us about sources of particles. We know what the C14 is in sediments. This is the, 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 the average value based on their analyses. And so we pump sample the nephroid layer, which you're looking at here, you're looking at temperature and you're looking at transmission, beam attenuation. So this is a nephroid layer where attenuation gets higher. And then we sample up in the, in the upper water column where the suspended particles are, are very low. And you can see that the number for the, the nephroid layer is definitely a mixture between what you get in the underlying sediments and, I wish we had a sample from here, but we don't, uh, from the overlying water column. So an admixture of newly created or carbon particles and, and older material from um, the underlying sediments. We have recent C13 analyses that of, of this material um, collected in the sediment traps, deployed right in, in, this, in the nephroid layer, that tell us that there is not a lot of terrestrial organic matter that is making it out into, just somewhat in, intriguing, I just got these, so I'm still trying to figure this out, uh, into, the, into the, the deeper nephroid layers in the Gulf of Maine. In other words, it's all marine. They're not having a lot of river transporting material making it out there. Is that bulk C13 or compound specific? Uh, this was bulk um, organic C, yeah, <coughs> bulk organics, yeah. And um, this is for, <laughs> again, on a, on, a, on a whim and a prayer, collected some samples and looked at microbial activity. My thought was, there's got to be microbes down there doing their thing. There's a lot of particles. There's pure, clearly labile organic matter getting down there. We also saw evidence of lots of zooplankton, which I'm not even going to show you. And so let's look at microbial activity. Now, the way you do this, I don't do this, but with my colleague, uh, Juliet Rudy Varga at UMass Lowell, we took some samples and she did a PCR analysis to essentially look at, uh, you produce something called an operational taxon taxonomic unit. Think of it as species distribution. So in other words, when these red and green lines uh, line up, which like they do in this set of samples here, near the red lines is a near bottom, the green is upper water column. When they're, when they're close, that means the communities are similar between these two systems. And this was a, a station where there was no benthic nephroid layer. Then when we went and did the same thing in a, in a very strong nephroid layer um, station, we found that these, if you will, um, OTU or these species, what we you think of a species distribution or, de or, or um, um, diversity, uh, were, they were very dissimilar. So in other words, the near bottom samples, the red, were very different OTUs than uh, than the groupings for the, for the upper water column. What this suggests is essentially that the, um, as, as per these, the PCR analyses, that um, you, you see a community um, composition in the nephroid layer uh, in, uh, in stations or in the near bottom, you see the nephroid layer creating diversity. In other words, they're probably, maybe they're more denitrified. So where the nephroid layer is present, the microbial population in the upper waters and the deep waters are, are different. Where an effluent layer is not present, they are more similar. So in other words, the presence of that suspended material is indicating by this, um, by this, by this community distribution that it, they are different, different groups. We have no idea what beyond this is, is, is happening. Another thing that happens in the nephroid layers are, I won't talk about this very much, but are um, cysts, diaphylatoid cysts. You've probably heard of the, you know, of red tide blooms. We have a lot of Alexandrium um, fundians in the Gulf of Maine that annually produces blooms, and a product of the blooms are these resting cells or cysts that go into the sediment and are the inoculum, or believed to be the inoculum, for the next year's spring bloom. And so what we did, um, as part of an EcoHab program, and I, my component was, of course, doing all the nephloid layer work, was look at the cysts in the nephloid layer. Because clearly, if they're residing in the nephloid layer, they're getting from the sediments to the nephloid layer, and they maybe are getting into the surface waters. If we understand the dynamics of that zone where they're residing, then we understand how to predict the blooms that happen that devastate uh, the shellfish industry just about each year. So what you're looking at is the highest concentrations of, of cysts in the nephloid layer, in the bottom 20 cubic meters of the nephloid layer uh, in the Gulf of Maine. So it, it, it's not surprising we have a, a sedimentary cyst bed up here. We have a lot, and high 
thick nephloid layers in this region and out into the into Jordan Basin. And so we're seeing lots and lots of cysts, or a high abundance of cysts there. So depending on how these move along the coast, this is another region. This is typically an area where we have blooms develop very early in the Gulf of Maine, uh, Alexandria blooms, this region off mid-coast Maine. And underlying this, so we're in the, in the nephloid layer here, underlying this is a very, very abundant uh, sedimentary cyst bed. So they're, they're tracking the cyst bed somewhat, implying that the, the cysts are coming from the sediments, but not, not completely, because there is not a cyst bed out here. So clearly, what's in the nephloid layer here in terms of cysts is coming, is coming from the Bay of Fundy. So can you use cysts, kind of the biology, as particle trackers on? Oh, and then we've done a simple 1D model that indicates it's tidal, tidal mixing, which, very, which isn't totally surprising, but tidal mixing is what's maintaining the cysts uh, in the nephloid layer as well as other components. All right. <laughs> so um, as a result of looking at carbon production, export, sinking, deposition in the Gulf of Maine, as well as some other very important regions, the Mid-Atlantic Bight, the South Atlantic Bight, a group of us got together uh, in January at VIMS and um, after we did lots and lots and lots of homework <clears throat> and put together budgets. Uh, and this was uh, my group's component for the amount of organic carbon delivered through the water column in each of these regions, comparatively speaking, on an annual basis, that which is resuspended and that which is preserved in the sediments. So, this data is all pretty much, this is all sub euphotic sediment track data uh, from these other, two, this from um, Mid Atlantic Bight, of course, of the SEEP programs, which were a, a fabulous amount of data. Uh, and then the re uh, also the same for resuspension. This is all of our track data, SEEP data. And then to look at this through, the, through into the sediments, if we're going to look at a carbon budget, we have to look about how to look at the DIC and DOC fluxes to determine how much carbon is lost, ultimately get at the, the amount that's buried, and that's provided here. Now the parentheses are the ranges, so it's, we go from export to resuspension uh, to burial, and then if you take the difference between the resuspension, I'm sorry, the resuspension flux and the delivery from the, from the overline, um, um, from the or delivery to the sediments, you get, in other words, that which is resuspended, that which is buried, the difference between that is that which is available for movement, lateral transport. It's going to go somewhere. And in fact, that's fairly substantial when you then um, calculate the areas of each of these regions, which are done through a model, and you look at the annual organic carbon available for the, this lateral transport per each of these domains in terms of teragrams of carbon per year. It's quite a lot. And what's interesting is that the Gulf of Maine is so high because the uh, sedimentation rates are very high and the organic carbon content is very high, two to three percent sedimentation rates of up to about, in the basins of about 0.3 centimeters per year, 250 centimeters per thousand years. And it's, it's similar to what's going on, if any of you remember way back when, what the, the, the high rate of organic carbon that is deposited off of Cape Hatteras. That's a region where we have a confluence of flows, where we have a depot center. And so very, very similar, although the region um, is, is a smaller, smaller area. And then we, we don't have, we need more work done in the South Atlantic Bight. It's very, very well. So this is all gonna come out soon. And, and I had been working on the Gulf of Maine stuff and then sort of encompassed it all into this, into this, um, into this workshop. So this is gonna come out, this is an uh, uh, ocean carbon biogeochemistry supported workshop and will come out in a report and I think it'll, it'll create a lot of discussion which I, and, and of course there's upper water column production values that compare all these regions and respiration in the water column and many, many other factors, but this was our section. So the Gulf of Maine is not insignificant is what I'm saying, <laughs> essentially to potential offshore uh, transport. And what's, what, What's important to note, and I'm just ending with this, is that, um, and I skipped that one slide, is there are some papers that have come out recently by Tim Eglinton and Jung Chuk Wang in Deep Sea Research, 
looking at the connections and the sources of organic carbon in the deep slope environment off of um, the, the north, northwest Atlantic. So if you just drew a line out from here or the cave, and they're looking at these nephloid layers that are very deep at the base of the slope, the sources of that carbon, up to 50%, appears to be, based on um, isotope data, alkenone temperature data and all, to be the shelf. And so one of his obviously um, uh, conclusions from that is that our shelf nephloid layers are slowly moving off onto the slope and feeding that, that carbon deposition. And those are all the people involved. Thank you. Well, we did say okay. Are there any questions before we break for Yeah, you, you, you did say that um, the production of that one has gone down, most probably because of the inclusion of the laboratory water being old and doesn't have much nutrients. Yeah. Did you consider the fact that also being a, being fresher, it would stabilize the water column, and that would do, would do also change the, um, the, the would affect the atom more than maybe the dye. Right, and I, I think that what happened in the '90s showed that with that with the the beginning of the the signal, the increase in fresh water or low saline, colder water coming into the Gulf made show that the, the increased stratification and an a enhancement of this bottom phytoplankton blooms. And that was d due to an increase in stratification. But now we have it's, it's uh, like a, a multiple layer of factors that are overprinting one another. So I think that your uh, suggestion hasn't been realized yet. It's just the, the, the nutrients that have been looked at. But in terms of over, I'd say, the next decade, we will be able to see what that, those large volumes of very high um, or very cold, low salinity water coming in with extremely low nitrate compared to slope waters of the past, all right, would say pre in the 90s and before, what, how that will impact um, overall stratification in the eastern versus the western is going to be key to this to Valley Tonga. I mean, I agree with you. I we just it hasn't been looked at in terms of um, specific production relative to you know historically. It's been looked at relative to the nitrate, but not to uh, levels of stratification. So we need to do that because I think that's that's it, if the projected. Um, theory, if the theory is correct, or the hypothesis is correct, that the art dump is going to stop tomorrow. So if we continue that, then we, we will definitely see a stratification attack. And I think um, production will, will probably overall be even more. Yeah. You're seeing it in the fish, the fish too. We have to separate that from the anthropogenic. So. Yeah. So, yeah. We worked together. Okay, so I'm wondering whether you know, he was showing the data kind of closer to Cape Cod in that yeah. region, and most of that I spent your heart on that here. Is there also the evidence for these networks? What is uh, it? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, well, it. If you think about the Gulf of Maine, there's that Mass Bay area that's very close to um, Cape Cod, you know, inside the Mass Bay is right here. We don't often find Alexandria blooms there. They're more in the off, they develop in the offshore regions over the uh, Wilkinson Basin in the western Gulf of Maine, and certainly off the mid-coast of Maine, if you know Maine, the Penobscot, Casco Bay region. That's where they develop first, and in the Bay of Fundy, and then the translated uh, from the northeast to the to the southwest, certainly connecting those two areas. So Don and I got together years ago because I went to him and said, "Hey, I got these trap samples from this nephloid layer. Have you ever did you talk about? I don't know anything about Alexander. I didn't. Now I do. Uh, you ever looked for cysts there? 
and said no. And I said, well, there are these really thick nephroid layers, and this was actually an idea of Maureen Keller's years ago. And when she went and died, we couldn't do it. So we said, well, we're going to do it for Maureen. And we checked the trap, started it, and you know, this is what happens. Someone has a good idea, and then they're gone, and you do it for them. Um, and you always put their name on it. <laughs> but the idea was that they are they represent a a, um, a sort of a hiding place for the cysts. Now, what is the now we're working on the residence time? That's why we're doing using them as particle tracers. What's the residence time in the nephroid layer using cysts as the model, uh, even though they have some biology associated with them? Uh, and do they move around? And can they help explain? And the the stuff that we just written up certainly indicates that cysts in the nephroid layer in the Gulf of Maine are very important to uh, the inoculum or to creating the spring blooms. Yeah, it's spring like they're the incubator. Yeah, yeah. Well, better to be there than in the sediment. You're in the water. I'm afraid the pizza's getting cold. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so, so let's face it.